Hello everyone, Gabe here, and I am joined by the gatekeeper of all knowledge. How are you? I'm trying to come up with new <laughs> ones every week. Um, You're gonna run out one day. No, I'm not. What are we doing today? Uh, you had some questions for me. Yeah. You're gonna interrogate me about RAM. Yes, yeah, so this is Beyond FPS where we're diving into hardware and kind of how everything comes together to create your PC experience. And we've been covered, we've covered CPU, mm -hmm. We did RAM, mm -hmm. and now we're just kind of following up on a few questions that I had, but also that we saw within the comment section and over on Twitter. Great. So, let's get to it. Smart time. So, you had a few questions for me, uh, and one of the questions was uh, dual channel versus quad channel. Yeah. So, we see at least a lot on the CPUs that we have. Mm -hmm. The desktop ones want dual channel, mm -hmm. but we've had some Ryzen CPUs that say quad channel. Yes. And I, what does exactly does that mean? So, you can also think of the, it's also the importance of the slots on the motherboard. So, okay. regularly when you have RAM, it looks like this. Maybe, maybe not this maybe, colorful. And also maybe from like 10 years, 15 years ago. I mean, RGB has always, always been popular, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you might have slots like this as well, where they're numbered in some way. Um, the important is that you can see that they are colored and you have two colors, or the RAM is offset like this. And the reason for that is, here's an example. So you have a CPU, it's doing its thing, we covered that in uh, an earlier episode, uh, and then you have some sort of memory controller, which is the CPU goes to the memory controller and says, I want a piece of memory. What the memory controller does is, the memory controller has a channel to the RAM. And if you want more RAM sticks, then you they are one after another. You can think of it you can think of it that way. And if the channel is thin and doesn't uh, transfer a lot of data, then you won't get a lot of throughput. Uh, a very common analogy is the highway. So you can uh, have a highway through how many cars can you pass through the highway? And you can think of the RAM as maybe the city. So if you want to go to one city, uh, if the highway is so, so big, you can only get so many cars through, all right? So if you just make the highway bigger, ah, nice, nice. you can get more cars <laughs> through. But there's still a problem. Um, you can only make the highway so big. So that's where the kind of analogy breaks down, yeah. where um, you can only have uh, a certain amount of traffic happening at the same time. Um, so there is actually a problem if you are asking for um, things at the same time or similar time, or uh, the CPU is asking for like two bits of memory uh, at the same time. But like, oh, I need this bit of memory and this bit of memory. Uh, in this case, they would come one after another. And in many cases, you won't notice. But if, that's a, that's a great, great setup of the, the pictures, but here we go. <laughs> hey, sometimes sheets don't always work, but this is fine. <laughs> Uh, if you have two channels, one after another, um, what might happen is um, you have a memory request one after another. If they are in the separate sticks, then you can theoretically double your throughput. So that's dual channel? Yes. So I, I had a question because you had the, the thing, the image display up before, mm -hmm. and often we don't see RAM the channels next to each other, mm -hmm. or they're they're interchangeable. Usually, you have like a, a D one, C one, B one, A one. Yeah. Why aren't they just next to each other? Why are they usually every other? Oh, that's more. So I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. So um, yeah, so you have the two highways. You th can theoretically double your speed. Uh, in actuality, you're never perfectly creating these sequential accesses. Uh, and in some of the cases, the data you're accessing isn't in, like you would have to perfectly split your data into the two RAM sticks or the two RAM setups, and you would have to perfectly ask for them at the same time. Uh. Then you get double the speed. So you can. Uh, in most cases, no, okay. you don't. Because maybe some of the, most of the RAM, or most of the data you're accessing is in one of the sticks, not the others. But in theory. Yes, in theory. And if you, you have four, four sticks, you have set up like this. So, you know, yeah, you notice the colors. Yeah. Okay, and why are they offset like this? Yeah. Uh, they don't have to be. So, what do you think, so if we have this colorful setup over here, and you have the red one here, yep. where is the other red one? 
Probably on the right side on the first one? Yeah. Yeah. That's why they're offset. Oh. Because then the yellow is here. <clears throat> oh. So the, the channel itself is under there. So if you think of the red and the yellow being next to each other, they are next to each other because yeah. they are in the same channel. But they're colored offset like this to help the end user know we should pair these together, we should pair these together for the best performance. So what happens if you don't pair them together? Because that's I think that's maybe a mistake that some people who mm -hmm. look at a motherboard for mm -hmm. the first time, they just go, oh, left to right makes sense. Mm. I'll put them on the first, the leftmost one and then the one right next to it. Yeah. So if you look at this one and you would put one the red one and one in the yellow one, you basically have a single channel setup. Okay. So you're just not taking advantage of dual channels at that point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and people often also ask about like what like, do I have to have the same sticks? You basically have to have a same stick. Um, the idea is that the sticks have to match in basically every attribute. Like, down to the cast timings, you have to match everything. Otherwise like the, you get instabilities, uh, confusions. Well, you might get instability, sure. I, I, I mean, that's got down to, like, maybe there's a, a bug or a problem or whatever. What usually happens is that things are clocked down to uh, the weakest one. Yeah, okay. yeah. So if something has uh, slower cast timings or slower frequencies or or even just lower size, the the motherboard and the memory controller are smart enough now that they will usually just channel things down. So you're basically like it's the weakest link is yeah. your setup basically. So that's why you want to keep. But of course, be really careful with instabilities because you don't want that. Rams finicky. Rams finicky. So. Timings. Yes, you just mentioned that, timings. So we have another video yeah. where I go into a little bit more detail into exactly its timing itself. So if if uh, Gabe remembers to put the thing, bloop. Somewhere somewhere there or in the description below, yep. one of the two. Yep. Um, so I'm not going to go into exactly the smaller details about it, but th why does frequency matter? That was another one of your yes. questions. Yep. So, Let's talk about frequency without talking about frequency. Oh, perfect. Perfect. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. So, frequency, you have a low and a high. That's usually how, how this is set up. You have a, a pulse, a before the pulse, or then the actual pulse, and then it goes back down. All right? And then you just have one after another. And that's a, a frequency band or, or some sort of... It's a wave. It's a wave. This is a, usually when you're dealing with uh, electronic components like this, you think of them as square waves. Square waves. Even though they might be a little bit sinusoidal, but they are square. So it's easier for us to think about it. So let's imagine that we have a cast timing of one. Okay. Which is crazy. Yeah, that's really low. That's really, really low. But let's imagine that. So you would have some sort of memory access or memory request. Even if it's a store of a memory or read of a memory, you would say like, I'm going to send in the access to the RAM. It would start here. And then it would, here, I have now access to the memory. It means that um, because the RAM is running in sync, they have the same frequency, that's why they're clocked down, yeah. that uh, it's, it's running in, uh, you think of it as lockstep. Everybody's marching at the same time. So if someone's faster or someone's slower, you get, you get everybody gets slowed down to whatever the slowest yes, one is. Yes, because otherwise this, this idea wouldn't work at all. Mm. So you would request something, then one march happens here, and now I know that after that one bit or one hertz, I can go back to that uh, chip and ask for the memory or know that someone has written the memory. Because then when someone else wants to read it or write it or whatever, they know again it is here, then someone else it's here. So that's the idea with the timings is, how many cycles until there's a guarantee that something is there or the action you have performed has happened. So if you have like a cast timing of 10, it means that after 10 cycles, whatever you did, if it's a write or a read or whatever, you can now guarantee that it has taken place and someone else can come in and read your memory or get your memory. So. When we're talking about cache timings, is that the cache timings no, within ca the RAM? No, CAS, CAS. CAS, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. Is that, so that's the timings within the RAM. Yeah. So that's what's first happening. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the guarantee that the RAM does saying like, after 10 cycles, 
you can be sure that when someone else comes in and wants to read the data you wrote, it's going to be there. Uh, okay. After nine cycles, I'm not going to guarantee that it's there. It might be there. I don't know. So, so the lower the cast timing you have, mm -hmm. yeah. the faster everything else on the computer gets to use yes. that information. Yeah. But here's the thing. It's counted in cycles. Yeah. So if you have a higher frequency, it actually takes less time to cycle through that many. Yeah. So how, how much time are we talking about we're, here? We're still talking about like nanosecond ideas here. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so if you have a, let's say one gigahertz memory and a cache timing of 10, it would then ten, take, take 10 cycles of those 10 giga, uh, one gigahertz to do a thing. If you would have a two gigahertz memory, but still a cache timing of 10, you're twice as fast. Yep. So that's how you can think of it. That's why people don't want to mix up like cache timings and uh, frequencies because they're kind of like if you have faster memory but the same timings, yeah. it's actually better. Yeah. But if you have faster, and this is what you usually see is if you have uh, a higher frequency but a higher cache timing, yeah. people think like, oh no, that's bad. Yeah. That might not be. Like you have to do the math now. Yeah, <laughs> depends on how fast you're frequency is relative mm -hmm. to the timing changes. Yeah, that's why when you look at older memory, you might see very low cache timings. But like, they're really slow. Yeah, so that's why. So it's basically find the balance. If you're going to buy RAM, find a good balance. Find a good balance oh, and test things. Yeah. Always test it. Great. So uh, yeah, and if you would have a, a slow cache timing, you would do the action here and then it wouldn't be actually available until here. Great. So. Yes. Um, and then you had a question about RAM usage between different programs. Yes. So I was just genuine, like, just curious. Mm -hmm. When you see some games that need like 16 gigs of RAM, mm -hmm. or some games that need five gigs of RAM, mm -hmm. or some programs like Premiere, mm -hmm. you just it's like 60 gigs of RAM. <laughs> what what are what are they doing to need that much RAM? What is actually taking up RAM on your computer? So usually with games, it is um, model models and textures and sound. That's usually the big things that are being loaded. Uh, models maybe not the biggest, uh, but they can add up. Uh, textures can be very big. That's why people really try want to like optimize them and uh, use like a lower texture when you're further away or a lower poly model when you're further away. Uh, and sound, so sound is so very like we're very susceptible to bad sound, yeah. uh, and sound needs to be streamed in. Um, so it can be very tricky to. Like you want to like try to cache or, or put into RAM some of the sound you want to be using. So basically it's everything that you want to store and have access to quicker Yes. within any program. Yes. That's why Premiere uses like 60 gigs and you edit a video file because it wants access to all of the stuff faster. And there's a thing that games don't have that many desktop applications have, which is like, okay, you're playing a game and you're loading into the map, which is yeah. Basically, you're taking stuff from disk and putting it into RAM. Uh, That's the loading. Okay, okay. So you need to just wait until it's all How in. How do you do seamless worlds then? Well, you load while you're walking in the world. Mm. Do you remember in the, the Division 1 when you went into the Boo and yeah, you walked you a little the, slower? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You're loading. Yeah. Uh, that's it. It's simple as that. But then we found out that it's not, like, we can actually load it pretty fast. Yeah. So it's great. Um, but with applications, like you said, with Premiere, um, if uh, you're editing a video or, or you're doing something, you have many clips. Uh, let's say you have like a little clip that you're working with. You know that you can click on it and drag it out, yeah. and the video is still there. Uh, so it's just storing all that in RAM. The whole video is still there. It might do some tricks to like unload it and load it, like yeah. try to be dynamic, which I'm, I'm guessing they do some of it. But then you hit undo. Yep. And you might get it. a clip back, or you yeah. might get yeah. Where's that coming from? Is that coming from disk? They might do that. Uh, they might have some of it in RAM. Might they want have... it to be as fast as possible. They do. So uh, there is a difference between the usage of a video game where you know what you're going to load, usually either when you're loading a level or it's based on your surrounding. Uh, but in desktop applications, you might have a lot of stuff already in RAM because that's the nice use case. Um, and then, yeah, why not cache all the things? Yeah, so this was related to CPU cache. Yeah. So I know we had talked a little bit about the fact that there's a physical size limitation. Like yes. Cache in the CPU mm -hmm. is limited by the fact that the CPU is small. Yes. So my very naive question is why not make big CPU 
to make big cash? Well, for one reason, it's not the main reason, but one reason is the speed of light. It would take time to go to the edge of the cash. Um, another thing is how much benefit are you getting actually? Yeah. Um, there is a limit to uh, cash. Like a, a, a huge cash would be great. Um, but there's a limit to how much you are using, which we went into the early episode, which is the, the locality reference, um, that when you start scaling things up, you at some point start to notice, stop noticing. So diminishing returns, basically. Yeah. Uh, but still, that's why they do the layering of the L1, L2, L3, uh, and then try to have the L3 pretty big, because it's outside, they have more control. Uh, but if you make the CPU bigger, you'd have to make the die bigger, you'd have to change the manufacturing process for a thing that might not guarantee a speed increase for everybody. So I'm guessing that there's a, there's probably a, some great analysis out there on that. Uh, if you could have a, a one gig cache and it would actually be the L1 cache, yeah, it would be great. And your CPU would be really fast and loading stuff would be really fast. But you still have to put the stuff there. So you'd have to, there would be initial loading of things. And if you'd have to then put stuff out of the cache and stuff in, you still do the loading. So, so it's the not solution free. is yeah. to break physics and go past the speed of light. Got it, okay. Do it. Do it. Cool. Cool? Yes. But that's it for RAM, I yes. think. So we've gone on our RAM adventure. Mm -hmm. uh, next time we're gonna be looking at graphics cards, right? We're gonna look at graphics computing and graphics card. Nice. I'm excited. Cool. Get smart. Bye. See you later, everyone.